to Bagel Tech Big, the weekly show from the Bagel Tech Network that does the whole tech roundup, everything else that's gone on, all the fun stuff, and what a fun week it's been. Um, I've got a great panel with me this evening. Joining me, top left, Mr. James Hart. How you doing, mate? Good evening, Mr. Rankin, and uh, it's um, interesting what you define as fun, I guess. Well, there's been a lot happening this week, which is, I mean, the last couple of weeks, actually, to be fair, when I've been doing the Daily Show, I've kind of been sitting thinking, oh, I, I'm starting to the point where I can't get away with every other day now, which I could for a long time from sort of April onwards. I think despite, I think what's, what's happened is because this late summer thing's happened, we've completely forgotten that that, that Christmas is not actually that far away and they're starting to ramp up for it. So uh, it's, it's going to get busy. It is going to get busy all the fun times. Good week? Uh, very busy, but uh, fun. Thank you very much. Yeah, yes, I was up in Salford on Monday because they've started broadcasting from there now. Who thought it would poss- be possible? Well, there you go. And it's all thanks to your help, of course, James. Well, I was, I was there making sure, day. overseeing it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's all down to me. Next to James, we've got Mr. Ian Grant joining us from uh, A Day at the Seaside, buddy. Oh, yes. Right, oh, the week riding off. donkeys. I picked a good week. See, now this is where we need to educate Eric as to what a British seaside summer is all about. Riding donkeys. Yes. It's not a sexual practice. Fish and chips by the sea. Fish and chips. Paddle in the sea. Toffee Paddle apples. Paddle on the beach. Toffee got apples. The, candy apples. The there we go. We have to translate. Fantastic. And candy floss. Oh, yes. And cinder toffee, if you know what that is. Going cinder toffee. Is that the brittle stuff? The, like, yeah, it's like, like the middle of a crunchy. Yeah. You have some of that. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> but if you have people don't know what that is but damn self quite so you've come back coffee. you've come back about 15 stone heavier today then oh of course absolutely good man that's what you do when you go to the seaside um, uh, below him we've got Mr Mike Hurley a uh, long time no see buddy I am back Ewan I've, I've finally taken a break from my usual schedule to be with you what looking after the girlfriend and being under the thumb is that it no, no recording lots of recording oh sorry my mistake <laughs> Um, what have you been up to then? Just record. You got a new podcast out, you said. Yeah, we uh, launched a new show yesterday. Oh, on, with Stephen plug Hackett, plug plug um, five twelve pixels dot net. It's called Ungenius, um, which is U N G E N I U S E D. It's at ungenius dot um, We effectively find random Wikipedia articles and then talk about them. Oh right, no preparation. I hope not too much. Good man. Uh, and finally, last but by no means least. Mr. Eric Lanigan from California. Where it's about 95 degrees outside. How's it going, guys? Hey, we're not doing so bad ourselves here. I think we hit, um, uh, we only do Celsius over here, so I don't know what the conversion is, but we've hit 30 degrees today. Which for- so, so, for, so for comparison, that would be, I would say we're about one of the hottest days of summer right now. So where, where does that leave you guys Yeah, this on is- the Celsius conversion? Because I don't know either. Well, this is the hottest day of summer, but it's actually in autumn. Right, right. So, okay, so so we're having the same weather right now. Yeah, it's it's, it's uh, an Indian summer is the terminology, so over here. Got to love that climate change. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> Allegedly so. Uh, the week in technology, we've had a ton of stuff going off, but the big thing that's kicked in is Apple had an announcement that said, we're going to talk to you on the 4th, and there's a huge event happening with that next week, um, not just the keynote. Um, we're going to be at Elmug which is the London Mac user group. I'll be there. Don McAllister will be there. Don's going to be doing Mac Break weekly from there, I think. And also uh, Channel 4 are popping down as well for a bit of a hello. So if you're near the Wood Pub in Marylebone, get your butt down there. Watch the feed live with us. I've got a, I've got a feed. And uh, uh, if they don't broadcast it. And we'll, um, we'll be able to see the new Let's Talk iPhone thingy. So, And then, this week, Amazon stood up and delivered the killer blow on tablets, yes, no? No. no. Oh, no, all oh, right. We've got a bit of a bit of a split. Eric's nodding. Eric's saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. You but, go first. Oh. You guys go first. Right, go on then. So who, who wants to start off with the descent? James or Ian? Come on, James. I'll let you use you, you Okay, well, um, it's uh, a Blackberry, Blackberry playbook to start off with um, in... In Amazon's very special version of Android, so it's not real Android, it's kind of like um, a side swipe at it. Um, watch, watch those patent uh, lawsuits come in. Um, it's going to be using the Amazon uh, App Store. It's going to be using an Amazon browser. It's going to be basically the Amazon ecosystem on a tablet PC. And if you love Amazon, if what you think is what the Amazon 
is a benign company that's not intent on world domination in the same way as one might accuse Tesco, um, then abs- uh, Walmart, uh, one, one might consider that to be an absolutely fantastic proposition. They will sell millions of them, quite frankly, like they did with the Kindle, especially if they get the price point right, and, and world domination will be theirs. That, to me, is frightening. <laughs> so we've lost Walmart, Asda, and Tesco as a sponsor. Then Thanks I didn't say no. I didn't say I didn't say <laughs> some believe. I didn't say they actually are. They they might just be really. They may, they might just be like your, your local spa down the road. I should have said spa, shouldn't I? <laughs> I'm going to jump ahead to later in the conversation just to just to throw in something in support of what James just said about uh, Amazon's world domination. They're clearly going to dominate the uh, the media sales and even the online retail sales by giving everyone this tablet by which to access Amazon services, but. One of the biggest stories here, I think, is the Amazon Silk browser, which I, I know we'll get to later. I'm jumping ahead. But I just wanted to say that I think if any other company did this, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, the, the public would be all over them, whereas Amazon is totally allowed, just I guess, I don't know why, to just say, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, funnel all of your web traffic, including these secure certificates through our servers and keep logs of them and keep track of this stuff and use it for aggregate data and so forth to improve the browsing experience for everybody. Uh, completely funneled every bit of your browsing. I mean, people who were upset about the Facebook uh, button following you from site to site, even when you were logged out, this is not, that's nothing compared to this. To be fair, th- there have been browsers that could have done that in the past. You've got Skyfire and some of these pre-rendered stuff that actually send the output of a screen to your phone rather than the, you know, so you, you, you're generating flash actually on their servers. But uh, yes, that they've admitted to it is is kind of like a bit shamefaced, really, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's, it's just a window to sell you things from the Amazon store. But it's, it's more than that. They are well, watching. Well, yeah. I, well, hang on, because I mean, I think, you know... It, I think it, Google are doing that as well. We, we'd all be agreed that the selling... And they're selling. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, the basics of, of whether they're providing a service which is enhanced and operable and intuitive and serves the customer well, as opposed to something which becomes, I want all your data, I want to know where you are, where you live, and I want all the monopolistic stuff that can go along with that. Those are two different things entirely. And I mean, is there a suggestion that whilst there is the potential for privacy issues associated with Silk, is it actually going to deliver on that, or is actually what they're using it for a method of endure, ensuring a better purchasing experience? Here's my sense of why it is, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because maybe I just can't think of an example uh, of when Amazon has angered consumers and made them feel like they were being taken advantage of in a way that Google has, Facebook has, Apple has, Microsoft constantly has never stopped since they came into existence uh, so consumers are used to that they're used to feeling like these companies are trying to screw them over and do something wrong to them whereas amazon is just the company everyone's in love with you know just like the zappo ceo goes around evangelizing and, and writing about customer service is very underrated and they have such good customer service they that's why they're the i mean over the entire in- internet they're like the best site for retail buying and shopping mm-hmm of anything and of any type of thing from clothing to uh, solid state memory Um, and the shipping and the the prices and the shipping are almost always the best of any other site and the customer service they're all the the, uh, return policies are great free return shipping for a lot of stuff very lenient more so than brick and mortar stores Mm -hmm. and you don't pay taxes in a lot of places and they just seem to always delight customers and to charge less for things than you'd expect. The Kindles were always considered, or at least version two and onward, were considered underpriced compared to what the competitors were charging. And the books were sold for a good value. It was Remember, it was the publishers that conspired to raise the price of those Kindle eBooks. Mm. Amazon wanted to sell them for like five bucks. And they said, well, no, that devalues our product. So they had Amazon, every right to do that. They had every right to do that because Amazon is what's critical to Amazon's success and some of these large other companies' success is the, uh, the, the, the squishing of their, the supply chain. If they can get their prices down because they are buying in huge, massive bulk and shipped out, that is how they make their money. That is how, and of course, customer, <laughs> I think, I, I don't want to downplay Amazon's customer service because it is second to none. In, these, in this world where if you get if you have a problem with some with some company, you, you you end up getting an automated email back, or ended up having to go through an IVR system for forty five minutes. We're so used to that kind of poor service that Amazon is streets ahead of practically everybody else. You're absolutely right, but the supply chain—you're going to say everybody's happy with it, but people who supply Amazon, I don't think they really are. 
And the, the publishers have done very well to fight back to that. Exactly, because Amazon is a company that businesses hate, but consumers love. And I think that's the difference. They do What they do is extremely predatory. They've, I mean, businesses, brick and mortar stores, mom and pop bookstores, I mean, everyone in business hates Amazon and for undercutting the prices. I mean, think what, think what Apple must think of them now with a $200 tablet. I mean, and, and better cloud services, arguably, than Apple's going to have. Uh, so it's always been a consumer-facing, consumer-focused company. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think they've ever made a misstep in the way that any of those other companies have that causes consumers to say, whoa, take, whoa now, Amazon, let's, let's reevaluate how you're treating us. I don't think they've ever done that. I mean, let's, let's let's think as well quite logically here because, um, you know, you talk about Apple and I think you can use the same analogy because Apple is a business that companies hate because of patent disputes, because of monopolistic behavior and all that kind of stuff, but customers love. But I think the difference that you're talking about there, Eric, is the fact that journalists hate Apple, but they kind of love them at the same time. Whereas well, with Amazon, it's just pure love. There is no hate with Amazon within the journalistic right. fraternity. There's no criticism. There's no negativity. There's no, um, this is typical Amazon. This is, oh, this, you can see where Amazon's going with this. They're going to lock you in and then you're all going to be bending over and they're going to be rogering up the backside. I think that might well be Amazon's really clever PR as much as anything because you do see these, these personal stories about a supplier who, I, I read one, I don't know, you know, how much you believe of it, but there was a, uh, a musical instrument supplier who went to Amazon um, and um, no, Amazon came to them and said, how much are you going to sell this for? And they said, um, we'll sell it for this much. And then Amazon said, right, that's, and it's almost as if Amazon said, right, that's the going rate for these things. And they went to a cheaper supplier to get their supplies for less because then they knew what the going rate was. And so it was that kind of real predatory, it's, it's making sure that they get the best value for, for the, as you say, for the end user, but it's, it's not doing the businesses any good. But of course, that's not going to get featured in the, in the newspapers because it's not, it's not a consumer rights issue. And the, 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 the newspapers and the, and the media love to, 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 to jump to the defence of the consumers rather than the small businesses. Mike, you've been very quiet here, so... I was just about to chip in there, you, and you've read my mind. I was going to say, it's not just things like that, uh, James, that they fix. I mean, Amazon are known for fixing all sorts of uh, products. For example, in the Amazon App Store, if you submit an app and you may select to, to, to have your... Um, you can suggest to Amazon, oh, I'd like my app to cost $2, but they will make the decision. So if they feel that your app is only worth 99 cents, that's what it will go on sale for. Mm. And they have the ability to change the price of your application as, as much as they choose. Which would work just fine and dandily if they were still paying you your, um, uh, your cost price and then selling it at whatever profit they wanted to make. But they're not. They're dictating the amount that you take at the same time, which is very mm. bad. Yes. That's the same as all the supermarkets, don't they? Yeah. They not, not to go back to a too far of an old point, but I did just want to add that what you and had previously said, which is that I don't think it's just journalists who hate Apple, but but like Amazon. I I mean, I know from from facing that chat room night after night that I mean, there it is a religious war uh, of Apple that that extends way beyond journalists. There, I mean, people. I, there, there's t-shirts, yes. right? So I I think that it's also I, a, Amazon, as far as I know, has has angered just no one anywhere who's not in business competing with them. Yeah, I think if you look at Apple, I think it's geeks that hate Apple, though. Windows user geeks that hate Apple. I don't think mainstream consumers who walk in shops and go, oh, look at that, darling. Hate My Apple. wife hates Apple. Well, the difference, yeah, the uh, difference is there is a perception. She's your wife, mate. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's true. There is a perception that they're overpriced and that they try to gouge their customers and do yeah. things unfairly. I mean, we've been talking on this show for months now about how they've been doing some things that raised eyebrows and said, oh, that's not really that consumer focused. That's kind of pushing their own agenda for profits that, mm -hmm. at the expense of what consumers really want. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think Amazon can ever have said that about any of their decisions. No, I think that's the, I mean, you, you said earlier on, you know, there's, there's exactly the point. There is good customer services. It's all given at a relatively good price. The delivery is phenomenal. I order something yesterday, it comes today. You know, it, it, and the, the, if you've got an issue, the only thing they had a little bit of an issue with was the music store. When you wrote it and said, I haven't got my thing, it didn't download properly. Really? Because, you know, it was always like you're going to be pulling the wool over eyes and taking a fast one here. But generally speaking, they've got the business <laughs> end of things really well tied up. I think the other thing, though, is if you look at the Facebook angle, you look at the amount of data that's being stored in Silk, I can't see that Facebook's storing any less data than Silk is. 
surely. Oh, oh no, they are because this is storing this is storing the entire web, unless they absolutely have to. Like unless you're like you know unless you're browsing to some obscure archive.org GeoCities you know site, uh, they're going to pull from their own Gosh. local cache and not even go to the internet to retrieve that page. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, it's completely proxied. Yeah, well, the well, Elastic well, 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 If you go through the Facebook environment and navigate anywhere within that Facebook environment, they log everything that goes on there. And to a certain degree, aren't you keeping cookies, et cetera, in Google Chrome and that kind of stuff? And that's logging wherever it is that you go. True. It's not any different than that. But the, the key factor is what you do with the data. Because if you look at, at Google, when they look at the data that they get from searches and that kind of stuff, okay, they're not taking your individual IP and your individual name for your, your application. But Google's got to the point where it can predict outbreaks of influenza by the numbers of people who at specific times type in a search criteria that says flu symptoms. They reckon they can predict the prevalence of STDs within countries for the number of teenagers that type in STD symptoms. Um, now, that's, that's, that's brilliant. That's, that's great number crunching. But then the nth degree of that, and this is where I think Facebook is going to be going if you're not careful, is that you buy a Nike running application that goes on your phone that gives a geotag and says where you are, and it logs where you ran. And everyone goes, wow, what a great idea. I can log <laughs> where I run. And then Nike is starting to think, well, hang on. This person needs Nike trainers. So this person then buys Nike trainers through an advertisement within Facebook. Facebook get the kickback, Nike get the trainers. They then know when that person bought those trainers. They know how far they run. They know when the trainers run out. And Facebook can rotate the advert so that Nike ads pop back up when you do a new pair of trainers. That sounds useful. That sounds... <laughs> that's really insidious. good. It's insidious, but it's useful. But, yes... I mean, that's a phenomenal use of the crunching of the data, but that thing's already happening. That data is there, that prediction. If you look at the Google searches for purchase, they will tell you, first of all, when we're coming out of recessive uh, behaviours within markets. Yeah, but I think, I think you and you, you are, you're conflating the, the, the sociological, absolutely, the sociological, financial, the big picture stuff with getting to grips what the, with what the individual's doing. And, and I think... You're absolutely right. Google, Facebook, whoever. I mean, possibly even Apple when they were sort of logging the GPS signal and writing, you know, logging where it, where you were going. Ping is they've social all, engineering for music. Social engineering. They've, they've, they've done that, but they haven't sort of come out and say, they, they haven't made it public. Amazon have just come out and said, and you know what? Whenever you type a web address to your, into your... Um, into your browser, into this new browser, it won't go to the internet. It'll go to our servers and we'll give you it. And you go... Oh, that sounds scary. No, what do you guys Close think? You think this is... You, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Eric. Oh. Um, the reason I think this is really cool, I, I mean, if you, if you look at with the statistics about what they're actually saying and how this differs from even what, what Opera has done and like the old, uh, I think AOL did this, Earthlink did this, a couple of ISPs at the end of the dial-up era were doing this a lot, that kind of recompressing of images. I think Verizon is now doing some of that with video according to their terms of service on their wireless customers. Um, but this is really cool because when you put everything through there, they have the ability to pre-load, to pre-cache based on the predicted number of clicks. So like, if you're looking at a certain article on, on a newspaper site, newyorktimes.com, and you're reading an article, they know statistically from all the other users running Silk who have clicked on that site and used that site on their servers, what, you're, what next article you're most likely to click on. It mm. preloads that. Before you, even re before you even know you want to read it, it's on your tablet locally over the air. It's, so it's by the cool. time you click on it, it's literally like a PDF, like it's already in the, I mean, th that's never been done before. It's cool but scary. Well, now here's the separation, I think, and this is where it, the, the, the cool but scary bit really kicks in, James, that you mentioned in there. If you said to me, listen, Ewan, I know you're a big runner, so I'm going to track your trainers and I'm going to offer new trainers when we think you need new trainers to look after your feet. Do you want to enlist to this service? There's a million and one runners out there who are going to say, oh, hell yeah. And they're going to buy the application, they're going to buy the trainers, and they're going to buy repeat trainers when they know they're running out because they're serious runners. But what bothers me is when 
they're gathering my data, they're engineering that data, they're using that data to then start to throw things in my face that I don't want or need, but they know I'll respond to because of my browsing habits, because of my activities, because of my geolocation and all that kind of stuff. You know, if I'm walking past a restaurant and I'm hungry and I say, I'm hungry, what is there? I'm happy with that. I love that service. But when I'm walking past a restaurant and all of a sudden from nowhere, me ping, me phone goes up and pings and says, do you realize there's a, a Papa John's around the corner? No, go away. That's not what I want. When I said, yes, tell me, I meant, yes, tell me when I asked. Don't just yes, tell me. And the problem that we've got is that a lot of the companies are going to just tell them, just push it in their face. And that's where we're going to get the negative reaction. And I think that the Amazon browser thing, yep. if you go on the history of the way you've described it, Eric, as them being a decent company that have good customer services and quality products and care about their customers and care about their staff and care about their shop front, then the information they gather here is going to go for an enhancing experience rather than a pure marketing one that's saying, and do you fancy this? Do you fancy this? Do you fancy this? I mean, if, if I logged on to, to Amazon to buy um, uh, Assassin's Creed oh, Brotherhood I- today, and at the bottom it said, listen, there's two new books out, and based on your purchase history of the last two years, we thought you might want to have a look at these books. And I'm, I'm happy with that. Thanks very much. But no, I don't. And if I don't respond to them, they don't show them again. That's good. Yeah, I, I'm not worried that they're going to do a whole lot of, of marketing research with this. Um, I, I mean, not not in. Tar- I, I don't think they're going to target us specifically based on our browsing habits. I think they've they've kind of even said that. Uh, but it is a little bit concerning because I think that this could I think this could catch on. I think this could be game changing if it's as big as they say it is. Because think about it, this must be huge. This must be a huge difference in speed, huge improvement in speed, for especially over 3G. Oddly, there's no 3G version of this yet, but I'm sure there will be soon, and 4G and everything. But there isn't right now. But it's got to make such a big difference that they would risk causing a lot of consumer outcry, a lot of privacy flags, a lot of uh, you know, fear mongers on you know, the, the uh, Wall Street Journal columns and stuff saying, oh, Amazon, you know, look what they're doing now. They're spying on us. They're spying on us. They're just, risking it- that. They're risking just, making one of the biggest consumer missteps they've ever made, and I think they wouldn't do that unless the, the browsing improvement was substantial. And if it's substantial, then I think others, other ISPs, uh, possibly other tablet makers like Apple or um, uh, Google or Microsoft may follow suit and do this too, and maybe Facebook. And then when our tra- when all of our web traffic is, fu- is funneled through other companies who maybe we don't think so highly of, uh, and that's the, that's the new way that the web works in a couple of years, that could be scary. I was just going to say, this is, um, I, I, I take your point, and that is a rather, it's a thin end of, of a wedge that's made of something quite unpleasant. But uh, what, what, what it strikes wedge. me as is that, sorry? It's a poo wedge. It's a poo wedge. <laughs> that's the one. Um, it strikes me that Amazon have made, are making, are, are trying to get into the opposite of social, aren't they? They want to get to you before you ask your friends what do they suggest. It's, it's, it's totally not social. That's a good point. It's a lot more algorithmic. It's closer to what Google does. It's based on aggregate data. Yes, and we know that Google aren't particularly good at being social as well, aren't we? So um, I think that there, could be, there could be a bit of a battle there, a bit of a, sort of, um, a collision where, where companies are going to have to target their marketing one way or another. Are they going to do it by reputation or are they going to do it by hard sell? And that's going to be an interesting one. So, I mean, I think here's the question that you've got to ask yourselves is whether the social engineering that's being done on these sites, whether it's Facebook, Amazon, or Google, is being done for the purposes of enhancing the experience or whether it's being done to understand the marketplace and leverage the marketplace. Of course it's all being done to make money. I would suggest... It's it's exactly been done to make money. I would suggest that Google does an awful lot, which is to enhance. And yes, there's a marketing element that goes along with it, and that's where they make their money. Mm. I would look at Facebook and say they are dressing up social engineering as enhanced, but actually what it is is marketing. And I would look at Amazon, and I would suggest that it's marketing, blatantly it's marketing, but they want to improve the experience at the same time. And I'm okay with that as long as I've got control over it. No? Would you buy one of their tablets? Would you buy a... My card's sharpened already, dude. I, I don't know about you. See, I quite like the new Kindle. That's pretty. Kindle. T- no, this, so we, we, actually, this is a good point. You know, Amazon Fire Kindle. is one element of this that's come out, and the Amazon Silk browser is. And we haven't really talked about the hardware much yet. I'll but, tell you what. I'm a bit bit peed off of the fact that the what is it like fifty nine dollars in the US and eighty nine quid here? That's ridiculous. 
I reckon part of that is because the the international Kindles they don't do with special offers. That's one part. And oh. there's tax season. So there's yeah, no yeah, special the- offers discount for non-US Kindles. Right. Yeah, those special really offers give you a discount of. A, I'm sorry. Th- those special offers give you a discount of about thirty to, uh, I think between thirty and thirty to fifty dollars, depending on which Kindle hardware you buy. Sorry, so you were going to say as well. I was just saying that the uh, the cheapest one is um, is an ad supported device. So that's how they're they're keeping the price down on the uh, the cheapest of the devices. Is it's they're going, uh, they've got opportunity there to. Uh, well, no, they all do now. To you. Well, no, this, this just changed. That? This just changed yesterday. Now all the Kindles, I think, except for the, the except for the older keyboard models, but all the new touch-based ones and the new lowest end one. So that's I think at least three models, if not five, um, are all available by default. Their default pricing now is with offers. They've changed it so instead of opting into offers to save a discount, you now have to opt to uh, opt into no offers and opt into a higher price. Is now how they frame it to the consumer. So they're really pushing that. Hmm. I think we don't get the one with offers in. I think there's some marketing reason why we don't get it. No arrangements with the publishers. I can say it's over probably here more like to do with the original US. Um, uh, issues associated with, with control, you know, kind of like uh, regioning of, of DVDs is. So we're paying a, more, we're paying a, a greater price for a, a better standard of, of service because of less... Oh, yeah, we don't get any advertisements. Oh, that's, well, no, nice. saying- that's a better standard of service. But we will still be paying much more than the American one, I think. Yeah, that, I, I don't. Be- I don't know about. Yeah, that I just don't know. I don't know if even after the advertising cost is removed, if it's if it's more expensive. But I but I do want to clarify. You can get any Kindle version you want to. You can pay the additional price never to see any ads. But you pay like about thirty to fifty bucks up front never to see ads over the life of the All device. Right. right. Okay. Can I ask a dumb question about the ones with no keyboard? How do you type stuff in? The ones it's without like the touch. With the, the one without it's touch a- and the one without a keyboard, you just don't. You just don't type anything in. So how do you search for a book? You buy it online and push it to the Kindle. Oh, right. Well, that's a bit... I think I heard... I think... Well, I think I heard there was an on-screen keyboard, like the kind that you have to select with a cursor, like on a video game. <laughs> oh, really? I thought that was just on the touch, but that would make sense. Well, no, on the touch, there, on the touch there's a full uh, touchable keyboard, touchable just like keyboard. on a tablet. Yeah. But I, I, I didn't know that about the, um, the new Kindle. Kindle... Kindle Classic, isn't it? So the question I've got, and and I really have got this as an open question, uh, have we got to a situation where Kindle is, where Anderson has gen- uh, introduced three levels of Kindle, all of which are viable as as economic purchases, or have we actually got two that have come out now in the Fire and the Touch, and actually the the old Kindle now is on its on its last legs and it's dwindling out? Are they are they phasing that out long term, or is or is this a viable third product? When you say I the old that- Kindle. Oh. Because they they still sell the Kindle keyboard as they call it, and then they also sell this new Kindle where it's got Kindle a new Touch. industrial design. Yeah, and no, there's no there's the Kindle Touch, and then there's something called the Kindle, which is no keyboard, silver, looks like uh, it's like a hybrid of the two. Um, and it, I've seen a lot of people saying online that they probably just released that one just so it give you a medium point because people given an option between three will typically go for the middle of the most expensive so hence they're trying to push people to the touch but kin- uh, a- amazon now offer um kindle keyboard the reg- uh, the kindle um the kindle touch the kindle dx and the kindle fire yeah the kindle dx is ridiculously overpriced it's like you see all the the new kindles that start at like 50 yeah. bucks kindle dx is like 400 it's like what the heck what? <laughs> there, there's where does where does that come from it's like three, you, just can buy three get- you can buy three fires for that price not really, but uh, <laughs> no, I was going to say three seven nine. Oh, I was going to sorry, I didn't hear you, but I was going to jump in and say that. Um, uh, I first of all, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. I don't think they changed anything about the hardware of the Kindle with the keyboard. I think it's exactly the same Kindle yeah, that was on sale last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just changed so the price. I, I don't. I really don't think though that they intend that to remain on the market after the uh, supplies are gone. I think the only reason it's there, because a lot this, a lot of people have written about this and discussed it. Why do they think they need a keyboard that's diluting their product line? No, I think it's it's I think it's very simple. I think it's because none of the others ship until November twenty first, so they have to have something on sale. Mm. Yep. I mean, the, the, the new ones available to pre order now. Just have a look on Amazon itself. 
and they've, they've got them sat alongside the keyboard based ones. They call it the touchless. Yeah. I, you know, what's ironically, I think what might come out of this uh, Kindle Fire announcement for me is I might actually buy an e-ink Kindle uh, because that new price I'm looking, you know, 150 bucks. Uh, you know, I, I could I need to get into reading and I've been thinking about, you know, the brightness of the screen and stuff maybe hurts my eyes. I don't know. That looks uh, interesting. And I think a lot of people are saying that a lot of people might get into now buying the cheaper Kindles. So let me throw this one at you guys. If we're talking about a war of the screens and the war of the having too many devices and what device do you take with you? Laptop, iPad, tablet, phone, all that, all that. What, what does a person do if he has a Kindle, an iPad? If he has a Kindle and an iPad, does he then need a fire? Or is there, is there ever a reason for a consumer to carry a fire and a Kindle, regular Kindle, and at the same time? Probably not, because I think the idea is that one device does it all, doesn't it? It can, it can if you're not sort of wedded into the Apple infrastructure. You can, you can use your, um, your Fire as a, as a tablet because it supports Android apps, so you better play Angry Birds and cut the rope and all those kind of things on it, as well as surf the web, and then, then fire up the Kindle app and read a few pages of your book while you sat on the bus. And sort of, you, it's, one, it's everything in it, but you can do that with an iPad as well. So. I mean, uh, the other question that I've it's got cheaper. really as well is, is thinking about the colour. With the e-ink displays, it was it was obvious that the book was the book and you turn the page and, and it had that very usable experience with that. But with the um, the Kindle now, uh, the Fire, are, are we saying that the black and white text like a book is going to be good enough? And also the thing that bothers me is that 7-inch that tablets are accepted as being a good form factor for just general browsing and use and things like that. What's the magazine going to be like on this thing, though? Because, I, I mean, I struggle with magazines on the iPad because of the layout and the size of them. It's 7 inches, I, I can't see Vogue or, um, or any of those kind of mags kind of working for people. That's a good point. That's, as, that's a think, very good point, actually. It's going to be a different size layout. Magazines are not 16 by 9. Their, their aspect ratio is much closer to that of the iPad. Well, they're right. I would say, yeah, effects, I, would, aren't they? I would. I would also say, though, that uh, I think there is a technological advance that we're still waiting for in the in the flexible paper document that 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 you can have out in front of you without a frame, without being a piece of plastic, a, 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 an e ink thing which can be rolled up, basically, and that's not far off. And I think that's probably the future of magazines, where you do have something in front of you that's actually tangible, rather than something you need to flick around with. When you when you can swat a fly with your tablet. <laughs> yes, that'll be the winner. Pull it up, bam! <coughs> I know I've played with um, magazines on my my ten inch Android tablet, and that's hopeless. Mm. Utterly hopeless to try and format the thing and zoom in and read. Because yeah. you're, you're constantly doing that, and yeah, you're shuffling your fingers around on the screen. Yeah, I mean, if if you get magazines that are laid out for the iPad, they're fairly watchable. But if you get ones like, I mean, the original. Um, uh, Wired magazine that came out for the iPad, I found that a real chore to read because it was laid out like it was a magazine. It wasn't laid out like it was a tablet application. Um, and yet, here's the interesting thing. Just before they went to magazines on the tablet, they produced that. Did you see the um, the one that came out that was supposed to be a representation of how a magazine could look? And it was more like a little tiny movie experience with scrolling text that you move with your finger and buttons that you press to move stuff in. Like a giant flash movie, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it mm. works beautifully. But then every magazine just said, okay, I tell you what, fellas, go photocopy this month, turn it into PDFs, and just whack it into an application that will go onto the iPad. And you, you couldn't read it. It was pointless. The only thing that you got any benefit from was the adverts. And hell, there was a lot of those. I mean, you were talking 60% adverts in the Wild magazine, 70% adverts. It's huge. And I bet the adverts were moving as well. No, hardly any of them were. All right. That was okay. the point. It was, it was just like, point. why bother? There was a few of them that, you know, a couple of them actually thought about it, but most of them was just a case of, of you know, bung a picture in and that'd be done with it. Mm. I'll, I'll bet if you... I'll, I'll bet if... Uh, sorry. Go on, Ian. So, I'm just saying with magazines, it seems a real mistrick that most magazines now are generating content for the web in terms of video and, and other stuff online. That, they, that With a, a, digital, a digital magazine, they now don't integrate that straight into it. So if you're on the iPad and you're clicking your way through the pages of video review of the, uh, of the, of the item you're reviewing, you can click through and you, you hit the video app and you can watch the video. But there isn't. It does seem, as Ewan says, predominantly they've just photocopied the current app and stuck it into uh, a PDF. And it really is a real shame because that is one medium I think the tablet's great for. Well, I mean, does anyone subscribe to the newspapers and how do they compare? 
No, I mean, to be fair, though, as well, Ian, I haven't touched a magazine on the tablet because of the wired experience. And there's the, there's the real sad part, is that there's, there's possibly, a lot of them may have actually really improved the experience and really thought about it and evolved and got to, the, to grips with the technology. And they've got fantastic viewing experiences. I won't be buying them, though, because I just looked at it and thought, nah, not bothered. And that was that was two years ago, nearly now. Mm. Go on, Eric. By the way, saying- I- Who, me? Yeah, you, you were saying something. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, two things. One is I saw I saw a headline just this morning that uh, Rupert Murdoch's The Daily, that iPad only magazine style publication, uh, is supposedly only has one quarter of the number of subscribers that it would need to turn a profit. So that's just an update on that. Mm. But I'll bet that as much lip service as Apple, Google, and Amazon pay to magazine publishers and to a slightly lesser extent newspaper publishers but magazines are the graphic ones the layout obsessed ones that are generally the highest priced for for readable publication um they pay a lot of lip service to making their tablets the best experience for buying magazines oh they're gonna bring back magazines they're gonna the rebirth of the magazine and the, and the newspaper in print i think that but i th- i bet if you if you asked any of these guys you know you woke them up in the middle of the night and said hey do you think magazines are going to be here in another couple of years they'd say oh hell no Mm. I'm sure they don't really believe that because all these guys, you know, Larry Page, Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, they know that that's not going to last. They want, they just want to be able to give them that they want to pay the lip service and let them come in. They want to say, please, magazine publishers, come on and try it because they, they want them to fail on their own merits. They don't want them to say, oh, Amazon and Apple and Google, they're keeping us out of the market. They're destroying our business. Uh, they will say, no, come in, set your own price, do your own layout. And then they want them to fail because consumers will say, well, the text is too little. What is this? I can't resize it. I can't choose my own font. It's not like an ebook. It's not like a web page. It doesn't have clickable links. I mean, they'll let them fail on their own and let them obsolete themselves. But I think if you look at the at newspapers is a good example. If you're talking about the home newspaper reader where, you know, the kid goes along in a bicycle and throws a paper out onto the lawn, I think that market's dying and dying very rapidly. But what I think's not dying, certainly here in the UK, is the market for papers where people are going to work and they're doing jobs which are essentially very practical, builders, carpenters, uh, blue-collar trades, even white-collar trades when they're going into an office. And I think people are driving, getting petrol in the mornings, getting a sandwich from a, a supermarket, and they're buying a newspaper as they pass to sit and read it. You know, the passing trade on newspapers is where their, their future lies. Interesting. I don't know that that will go that quickly in this country. Well, interestingly, trade publications are not the ones that have gone to tablet formats it's the general interest ones you know your time your newsweek or right that's not, no t- newsweek is gone time uh uh wired uh sports illustrated that kind of a thing the very general broad audience stuff mm. so um i mean in terms of of uh, well, let's not use the word ipad killer here but in terms of success or failure of the kindle fire are we saying hit or miss james they've timed it well i think Mm. Um, and I think the way that the Kindle's taken off, I've seen, you know, uh, I tend to use the, the commute as some kind of barometer of the success of a, of a product. And I am seeing as many Android phones as I am iPad, I, iPhones now, but not a huge number of iPads. Um, but loads of Kindles, people are getting their Kindles out because they're portable. I think they're going to do quite well with this because they can sell and sell and sell, regardless, mm. of, what, regardless of what's happening underneath the surface. So I think it's going to be a success. Ian? I agree. I, I, I do think it's going to be a hit. It's a great price point for a little device. Again, I'm a little, lot, much the same as James. I'm a little bit worried about what's going on behind the scenes and whether it's an incredible marketing device. Happy. But overall, with the specs, true Gorilla Glass, IPS screen, it's going to be a great little device for a couple of hundred pounds. Mm. Mike? Oh, mate, you're all quiet. Oh. Wobble your cables, okay. mate. I was say, I th- okay, I think it will be, to be honest, uh, simply because it's going to be pride of place on the Amazon homepage, and it's going to be at a price which I'll be able to put slap bang in the middle of it. And people, you know, people that are interested in a tablet, um, they're not sure whether they want to get an iPad, will drop the money for that because it's half the price. Mm. Eric, last word. It is an, it is an iPad killer. It absolutely is. It is the first company and the first tablet who can actually cannibalize Apple's sales. Or not cannibalize, but eat into and dig in. It's not It's not cannibalize if it's a third-party company. But it's really going to give Apple a, a hard time. I mean, a tablet for half the price, less than half the price, way less than half the price. That's insane. 
And it, it's going to hit that sweet spot where most people use a tablet for, you know, it's 16 by nine. It's better for watching movies and TV shows than an iPad is in terms of the aspect ratio. It's smaller. So you have it with you in more, more times. Um, they even tried to tell you that it's more uh, durable to put in a purse or something along with keys and other things, according to their images. Uh, but that price alone is going to just throw people. I, I don't know what Apple's going to do to try to come back with that. Meanwhile, Microsoft is off on the opposite end of the spectrum saying, no, tablets aren't consumption devices. They're the office workhorses. That's why Windows is going to be mostly tablet based. So I think Amazon is going to be the most successful here. I mean, the interesting thing, I think, with the app stuff as well is is that that. Uh, I know I was, I was trying to round up here. I've just thought of another point. Um, they were saying, no, it launches right immediately with 10,000 apps. And everyone goes, oh, well, 10,000 apps because Amazon, uh, Apple's got 100,000 apps. Apple's got 100,000 apps, most of which are utter shite. So Bezos has got the benefit of looking at all of those applications and saying, that's a good app, that's a good app, that's a good app, that's a good app. Come over here. And they probably, you know, they may not, they may have iFart on there, I don't know. But... They, there's an opportunity to have 10,000 core applications which are of a higher standard and more um, sellable. Do you know, one, of the great, one of the great things about the Android Amazon, uh, the Amazon Android App Store, is they give a free app a day, um, which is a paid app. So every day they will pick a paid app and, it'll, and you can download it for free every day. And it's always a good app as well, or typically a good app. Yeah. Excellent. Good discussion. Um, uh, Ian, you had a story for us about patents. What was this one? Oh, yeah, I won't, I won't believe it too long about it, other than, interestingly, that Samsung have started paying Microsoft, of all people, for um, patent, uh, patent fees. For, I'm not entirely sure what, because it didn't actually say, but it's to do with the Android operating system. Right. So Samsung are using Android, which is rused by Google, and they're giving money direct to Microsoft instead of giving it to Google for Google yeah. to give it to Microsoft. Yeah, or even giving it to Apple, as Apple are after him on the side, which is quite unusual. But yes, I was trying to look through to see if I could find out actually what, they, what they're paying for. I can't find actually what particular bit of IP they're paying for, but in the ongoing, and the ongoing is slightly dull, but also slightly compelling patents nonsense, we find that Samsung is indeed paying Microsoft royalties over, the, over Android. Not Microsoft, yeah. not Google. Not and Apple. they join, they actually join quite a few companies that are actively paying Microsoft up to like $6 per phone per device Ooh. rather to use Android. It's this, re when this came out yesterday, it's, crazy, um, it? it's, in, it's, it's insane. It's really scary. And by the way, it's exactly, it's exactly the kind of behavior that Google is talking about when they say, don't be evil. That's exactly what they mean. Competing by suing the free competitor out of existence by making it not free. That's so shady. And, and if you saw the response, they taunted Google on Twitter. The head of Microsoft communication said, let me summarize Google's uh, extortion comment. Wow, like a little baby crying is what they wrote on Twitter. I mean, th this is Microsoft. This is who they are. It's really, it's crazy, but that's, they're still like that. I mean, they're collecting a lot of money from a lot of patents across stuff. I saw that, that Casio this week are paying Microsoft um, uh, a patent fee. And uh, it was suggested in the story as well that actually what Casio are paying them for, if it was enforced in a court, Linux would be in real trouble because it would rip the heart out of Linux because it's the same code that Linux should be paying Microsoft for, but they've never collected on it. Now, I have the actual numbers. I, do you know what guys are the numbers here? Go for it. The, um what? Yeah, go for it. Uh, sorry, the, the delay here. Um, the um, uh, they want about. First of all, they're asking. They're by asking in a, in a lawsuit. They're hoping to get about eight dollars, roughly seven fifty to eight dollars. Uh, that's the, per Android device that they claim is an infringing device, mm. which is all Android devices. Um, in the case of Samsung and HTC, and the ones that they have been successful uh, in their cases, they're estimated by analysts to be getting about. Uh, three to six dollars per phone. So let's say six dollars. Meanwhile, the Windows Phone Seven license, again private. It's this is estimations from from analysts, uh, is roughly about ten to fifteen dollars. So six dollars, ten dollars. That's practically the cost of Windows Phone Seven. So that is very dangerous for for the Android operating system. That's a lot of money in proportional terms. Yeah. That's a huge amount of money on raw cost. Mm. Yeah, and I saw, and the same article pointed out that uh, that's off of like hardware margins of like ten percent. I mean, there's so little margin in in this hardware. Tablet makers have no margin. That's like three percent margin. The article said 
on what they can make a profit off of hardware tablets, the OEM tablet manufacturers. So yeah, it, that, they're really trying to destroy Android based on cost. I mean, I, I, this might be an interesting discussion if anyone's prepared to have it with me, but um, I bought Tiger Woods Golf 12 for iPad and for iPhone because it's, I saw a story that said it's being given away free of charge. Oh, wow, I'll buy that. So I bought, I bought it in inverted commas. When I got into it, yes, it let me play the game, but it severely throttled my abilities as a golfer. And when I went to pay money on the, uh, you know, here's, here's your winnings, go and buy your extra skills and stuff, um, it was very quick to tell me that I hadn't got enough to buy it. But for an extra £1.79, I could have $50,000 to spend on my upgrades. And I'm sitting thinking one seventy nine. that's quite a price. And... For I got, what? I got it. What for, are you buying? You are buying fifty thousand dollars. Pretend money. Absolutely nothing. No, exactly. I mean, it, I didn't. It wasn't purchased and logged to an account. It was only on that app. So if the app freezes and crashes, and I have to take it off and then reload it, all of that money that I've paid is completely lost, and all of my golfers' history is completely gone. But I'm well aware of the fact that I didn't pay any money for the application, and it's a very valuable game on its own. And if I've got any patience, I can actually do it. But in terms of of making profit, as we've just been talking about there, you know, all these guys are looking for new models to make profit. Mm-hmm. And some of them rail against me, but but then actually when I sit and think about them logically, well, I didn't pay for this, so, you know, I can't... So you're suggesting they come out with an Apple app, which is like, raid my patent, and you just, like, click on these things, and you pay £1.79 every time you click on no, something. No, what I'm saying is the way that companies I'm are sourcing profits has had to change. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's no longer the same world of, I made a great product, it's over here, come buy it if you want. And that's because people, it's yeah, all because about so much... It away and then on costs, on sales. And it's, it's amazing, actually, to consider if, if, if uh, a sign of wealth back in Victorian times was a, an absolute house full of stuff. But now you can't tell how wealthy somebody is because they are churning their money into things you can't see. They're watching, you know, Netflix subscriptions and MP3s and zing, zing you know, and, and, and ringing up Big Brother to vote people out and spending money on virtual stuff, uh, virtual property intellectual property that people end up having a wonderful world in a computer and you kind of think well hang on a minute where's that that money that money is 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 providing people with food to eat but actually you are not getting a product from it thank you hg wells <gasps> by the way here's a little bit of Go on, another, little, another, another little bit of info to throw in here uh the oems according to paid content uh, the, the OEM manufacturers who are currently actively paying Microsoft uh, licenses, royalties to use Android include HTC, Acer, General Dynamics, iTronics, never heard of them, Onkyo, Velocity Micro, ViewSonic, Wistron, never heard of them, Samsung, well, and Samsung. <laughs> and Motorola is currently in litigation with them. And here's another interesting uh, data point. Supposedly, this is based off of, off of what is this, off of a... Uh, Korea Times, um, I guess a translation, I don't know. This is from GigaOM. Uh, supposedly, a Samsung, an anonymous Samsung official in Korea said and gave this quote to their paper um, Samsung knows it can't rely on Google. We decided to address Android IP issues on our own. Mm. And, and maybe and that's just what, the other day. Well, maybe just that's the other what day, Amazon's going to do. Well, I'm sorry, just to finish. Just the other day, they said that they were going to. Uh, back this new Tizen, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, T-I-Z-E-N, that uh, this new Linux-based mobile OS, that Samsung is going to be a backer and developer of this new Linux-based mobile operating system. And supposedly, they're upset about Motorola. Oh, sorry, I didn't read that part. It says, if Samsung truly believed that Google's takeover of Motorola mobility was going to be helpful to the entire Android ecosystem at large, it would have waited until that deal was closed before concluding, before concluding the license agreement with Microsoft, said the Samsung official. And they know they can't rely on Google, end quote. So I, that's why they're doing that. They're actively, Samsung says, okay, so now Google's going to try to do their own, their own version of, a, of a, what Amazon's doing or what Apple's doing. They're going to make their own device and tie it more closely to their own ecosystem and protect Motorola and indemnify them against Microsoft. Uh, so we're just going to say, forget that. We're just going to build a Windows Phone 7 devices or Linux. That's kind of what it looks like here. Do you remember well, that's the, the, point. the series in the 80s or 70s, Soap? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Confused? You will be after the next episode of Soap. I mean, I, I'm as far as the painting disputes go, I am utterly lost with it at the moment. 
That's but the point is, the, the point is, I don't think you can build an operating system without violating one patent or, or old patent or another. And so you're just going to be walking into firefight after firefight, no matter what you do. Samsung, as you say, is going to be looking into this new new Linux-based operating system. But as soon as you start trying to make money out of something, something somebody's going to be looking through the source code or whatever to find out what they can claim on and unless you can completely innovate from scratch you're going to be screwed well, or except except for the fact that the linux community because it's open source and there is no money changing hands on one you kind of wonder how they can actually make money how they can claim from that money's not not an issue with patents as far as I mean, <clears throat> you can enforce a patent whether anyone's making any money off it or not a breach of patent right. is breach of patent uh, it's like breach of copyright. Oh, it doesn't cheap. matter if you've lost anything from it. If you breach the copyright, it's still an offence potentially. The the ideology though behind all of these things is whether you are. I mean, I mean, it, it's poker. It, it is it is poker face all the way because Microsoft ring me up and say you've infringed my patent. I want you to pay me a license fee. And I look at it and it's whether I've got the balls to say no, I haven't, mate. Come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. And what's interesting this week, tying in with the patents discussion, is that Apple uh, registered a patent for multi-touch, were granted the patent for multi-touch, and they've gone back to look for enforcement now from the patent office, and the patent office has said, nah, sorry, bugger off, mate. And that's that's really interesting because that uh, you look at the number of devices that have got multi-touch, even you know, Kindle's Fire, it's, it's only a two-point multi-touch, but it's still multi-touch, and Apple cannot do anything to quash that. It'd be interesting as well if some of the patent dispute with Samsung over in Germany is centred around multi-touch because that's now completely gone, isn't it? Interestingly, uh, over here, they also this week were denied the trademark on multi-touch, which, which they had filed, filed on the morning of the, that they introduced the first iPhone in 2007. And they were denied it, even though they were the ones that um, really brought that term multi-touch into the basic everyone's vocabulary. Uh, now the, the the lawyers who looked at that, the attorneys said, well, we can't give you this trademark because it's it's a generic term. It's used by too many people. Mm. Well, I think the th There's an interesting number for you before we, get, before we leave this. Apparently, Goldman Sachs estimates that Microsoft will suck up $444 million in Android royalties over the coming mm. financial year. Wow. Yeah, it's actually more. It's many times. It's a couple of times more, at least, than they make off of Windows Phone Seven royalties. So they make and Microsoft makes more money off of people using Android than they do off of Windows Phone Seven. It's madness, isn't it? It's absolute madness. Interesting point in the chat room from uh, Russ saying uh, you can't build a new operating system without asking half the technical companies that are out there whether you can have their permission first or not. And I think you can. You can build it because then you're into the poker game, whether they mm. really can come and get you or not, or whether you're just... I mean, I've got this idea that I could make an operating system that would legitimately run Logic application or any of the, 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 Microsoft, the um, Apple applications, because as long as the, 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 the virtual machine will support the application, I can't see how that's a breach of, uh, of anyone's patent or anyone's copyright. But you, you, you're not going to be able to have a, a, a mouse pointer. You're not going to be able to have Windows. You're not going to be. Able, you're going to have to find a way to do it that doesn't look like anything else. Mm, definitely. And look who's it? and look who's talking. What is Microsoft and Apple paying royalties to Xerox? Mm. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't think they are. Are they? No, oh, never did. Right. UK two are our sponsors. Please, please, please support them. They are a fantastic bunch of people. Um, I've had a couple of email exchanges with Craig because there's been a lot of things happened just recently in uh, between the two of us. Um, if you support the Bagel Tech Network, then please support UK2. If you want to buy yourself a domain name or web hosting or e-commerce stuff, uh, co-location services, VPS servers, please go and check out their prices first. Go to our web page, and when you find our web page, scroll yourself down and click on the UK2 logo. Once you've clicked on it, that'll take you to their website and you can have a browse around and buy whatever services you want. When you go to check out, put in the offer code BAGELTECH and you get 15% off, all one word. Or if you're transferring a domain in and you don't want to pay the domain registration service, then um, you have to type in Bagel DNS, and that'll take, your bagel, that'll take your domain management service charge off as well as. So you can use both codes there. Um, equally, if you would like to have a go, you can win a Nintendo 3DS. 
If you go to the logo just below and click on it, they'll take you to a page where all you've got to do is give your name and email address. Uh, they've probably got that anyway if you're a customer. And then answer a simple question about the hard disk drive size of the UK V400. And once you've typed in there that it's two terabytes, you can uh, submit your entry <laughs> and, uh, uh, and you're entered into the draw for the Bagel Tech Nintendo 3DS. Three prizes there to win. Uh, again, I mean, if you're a customer already, it's not going to matter. They've got your details. But if you support Bagel Tech, please show them that you're appreciative of their support of the network and go and enter the competition. And hell, you'll probably even some win something from it. So um, please look after UK2.net. We would be utterly and totally lost without them because they pick up every piece of bandwidth that we sap up. And we're doing a lot at the moment, and it's going to get worse, I think, over the coming months. So, so thank you. Or better, depending on how you look at it, Ewan. Worse as in the consumption will get worse. Worse and worse. <laughs> uh, uh, the effect is good. Um, also, as well, I forgot to say on our website, uh, we're still up for the European Podcast Awards. I know I haven't talked about it for a couple of weeks. It, voting doesn't end until November, so uh, now's the time to really go and start casting votes. Go to our website and you'll see a big blue box there. Click on each of those logos and it takes you through to a page where you can vote for us. And all you've got to do is, is rate us in terms of stars. Click on vote there and uh, put the stars in to the level that you want. Click vote. All of them. Yeah, make sure you do all of them. But And you can enter as well there as a competition to win uh, a prize with them too. So um, what you can do with Bagel Tech is just win. Hold on. Have we got any cool thingies? James, have you got anything with big aerials for us? Um, I've, I've, I think I've almost got ground clearance to buy my thing with a big aerial. But already I'm looking... <laughs> I'm already looking towards Christmas at the moment, and um, basically what I've done is I've just reduced the bandwidth to the to, to the modem. Just going, we've got we've got twenty k up and down now. We need a new router. No, um, I'm looking for something for Christmas, and I'm trying to get rid of wires. I do like my wireless. Unfortunately, the the, the uh, wireless Bluetooth speaker I've chosen, which is a Creative D100, only sixty quid, but sounds pretty good. Uh, hasn't got any aerials on it, so I'll have to. To sort of stick a couple of uh, pencils on, um, but it's the Creative D100. I'll put a link in the chat room, and uh, I, I, it's got reasonably good reviews and it's a reasonably good price. But I think the f that when you, you you come home from work after you commute, you've had your headphones on, and you want to play the track that's on your iPod, your iPhone, your your, your Android device. All of them have got Bluetooth stereo on them, so you'll be able to press a button and for it to come play into your on, on your speakers in at home. It's just so cool. Mm. And I think that's the future wireless wireless thingy. So um, it's called the Creative D100, and uh, and as soon as I get one, I'll let you know how it goes. Right. So you've uh, yet again this week, you've managed to pick something that you've not yet purchased as your cool thing. Well, I, I, I I'm not made of money, you. <laughs> It's, what it's what I'm doing is I'm 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 basically using the Bagel Tech show as a as, as a as a kind of like a, what they call a financial Amazon business wish case list? for my wife. An Amazon wish list, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's an aspirational cool thingy. But wait, I got, this is the point in the show where Eric always has to ask one for one British translation. What do you mean when you say aerial? Antenna. Got it. I thought so. Just wanted to clarify. Okay. <laughs> okay. Glad we educated you, mate. <laughs> you and me need to do a transatlantic show. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Bagel Tech Trans. Uh, Ian, have you got a cool thing for us? <laughs> Yes, right. um, I've been messing around with the with the Amazon Fire coming out this week. I've been wondering about my old iPod Touch and when I could make it into a book reader on the cheap kind of thing in these fiscal financial times. I've been playing around with some of the book reading apps, and I've got to say I can highly recommend a couple. Stanza. Oh, which Stanza is, a is awesome, book, yeah. And Good Reader, which opens just about any kind of document format file I've ever seen. I threw a whole load of different things at it. It was really, really two really good at laps. To sort of enable you to turn your, your iPod Touch, which I don't use as much as I used to, into a handy little book reader. And it's got an advantage over your Kindles and things because it's backlit. So you can read in bed without annoying the wife and have light on. And it's free. And it's free, yes. Excellent. Absolutely. No, Stanza's free free. brilliant. Um, Stanza also does, I think, PDF support, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Again, that one will open just yeah. about anything. I've, I've downloaded a few of them to see which ones I like the best. Yeah. Can you do annotations in Stanza too? I've got it in I think you could. can. I think you can. Yeah, no, it's, it's Stanza's a really good app. Really, really. Yeah, you can annotate. You can annotate in Stanza. That's brilliant. You can indeed. Excellent. Very, very good app. Well worth the money. 
Oh, yes. Mike, what you got for us, mate? I'm going old school today, Ewan, uh, with the first generation iPod Shuffle. Um, I've recently got myself a MacBook Air, um, and I'm going away this weekend, and I need to put some video onto it. Um, believe it or not, I don't have a USB to USB cable that I can find anywhere at home. Mm. Um, so I've been putting the video from the iMac onto the USB shuffle, plugging it straight in, job done. It's one of the only, I think it's the only iPod device where you can plug it in as, and it just recognizes it as a USB mass storage device, uh, like in the Finder. So, so, I was you just say, so your recommendation is to take something that's outdated and crap and turn it into something that's cool and fun and a thumb drive that it wasn't meant exactly. to be. Exactly. Exactly. Excellent, mate. We like that. It's, a, it's an attractive thumb drive. Dude, ata- adapt and overcome. Exactly. That's, that's exactly what that is. Well done, buddy. I like that. I was. Uh, I took the easy route. I went down to Best Buy this week and bought a four gig storage card instead. But uh, that's just the kind of guy I am. Uh, Eric, do I need to ask? Uh, Amazon Kindle Fire. Oh, dude. Yeah. It's pretty cool. That's it. Uh, <laughs> you haven't got one of those either though <laughs> no i don't you one day you're going to pick a cool thing and it's going to be valid and right and proper no i've got, you're not. I've got an apple water bottle right here is that that's kind of cool no yeah we went through those one last day. time that's that was your penis pump mate <laughs> are amazon kindles actually flammable I don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out whether it sh- whether it blends in a few weeks. Oh, I was going to say that. I was say the big question is: Does it blend? Does it blend? <laughs> does it, uh, the other thing that got me this week? They're calling it the Kindle Fire, and uh, I was just like, "What are they taking the piss? You can't be serious Kindle that they've come fire. up with Fire is the best name they can come up for it mm-hmm. with Kindle Ing. It's asking it's, for bad headlines, isn't it? It seems like a weird use of the word kindle it's like it sounds like a it sounds like a verbal like a verb phrase like kindle that fire like direct object of the <laughs> kindle of the verb kindle but it's not you wouldn't say that you wouldn't say i kindled that fire no kindling have you heard yeah. like the the slogan that they've got for that so it's the, the slogan is from kindle there's fire that's oh, the slogan oh yeah. no yeah I'd like, to the to another, I'd like to introduce you eric to another british word and that's Bollocks. Familiar <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with that one, I've heard a few times. Uh, yeah, show. you've heard it on this show a few times. Sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Describes that logo down at the ground. Uh, what I thought was kind of, kind of cool today, and I saw your tweet back to Andy Anatko on his review of Kindle uh, Fire, and you put on him, nice to see the use of the English bollocks and half assed And I thought he can't have written that in a national daily newspaper. Oh, I told and, you. Yes. And sure enough, He's written bollocks. I don't think he appreciates that bollocks isn't a cool word. It's it's <laughs> not really. It, well, actually, we shouldn't be saying it on air and still be using a clean tag. It's that bad. But there we go. Not bad. Is, is bloody still Anglo-Saxon a bad word? Words. Is what? Is bloody still a bad word? Couldn't you not say that on TV for a few decades? Uh, uh, yeah, but I mean, we kind of got rid of that in the 70s. We were all right with that. So You yeah. don't even say it anymore. Morecambe and Wise said it. Anything that Morecambe and Wise or the two Ronnie said, you could you could say. Mm-hmm. That's the, that was the kind of the maxim of British television. They were the, no they were the acid test. Uh, my pick, um, I'm not a great radio listener, I have to say. I'm, uh, I tend to sit and listen Boo. to podcasts. Now, I tend to listen to podcasts and audio books, and I listen to a lot of the, channel, the Radio 4 stuff, you know, like uh, the news quiz and that kind of mm-hmm. thing, but via podcast, so I can listen to it when I want. But um, I've got a DAB radio in my car, which I've, n- I've hardly ever used. And my phone had run out of battery and it was charging. And while it was charging, I put Absolute Radio on, on the DAB. And I've got to say, I've listened to it all the way home from York by choice this evening. And it's great. Great yeah. little run of music. Great little features on it. DJs are good as well. I listened to the morning show this morning. The guy on that was brilliant. Um, Absolute Radio. I think it's uh, it's my pick of the week for sure. And you can listen live online as well. So that's where it ties in with the, the internet digitally thing for the big show. But... Um, give it a try if you haven't tried it because I really, really enjoyed it. It was good. There what go. was once Virgin? Is it, did it? Was that Virgin? Uh, was yeah, it was Virgin, yes. It was bought out by an Indian bank and uh, is now Absolute Radio. And they are massive. They, they've they've grown in their, their listenership because they're actually playing decent music. I'm yeah. not playing the same thing time and time again. And I've, I've actually got, I absolutely love Absolute 80s. Yeah, and before you say it's, it's like Radio 2, it's not. No, oh, it's a, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a broad range of music. It's not all current stuff. It's not all old stuff. Mm-hmm. And they, they they do a lot of uh, live stuff as well. They do a lot oh, of yeah. festivals. Lenny Kravitz live. 
He's shown up here in Soho, yeah. So fantastic. Sorry, I haven't a clue. Good one, Russ. Yes, that's brilliant. I listen to all of those. They're good. Uh, cool. Um, we'll be back again next week with the big show as normal. Um, full house planned, I hope. And we'll look at the uh, the review of the week's tech news. By that point, Apple will have launched something and we'll be ready to discuss it on the uh, the Mac show as well. Um, we're having the Mac show tomorrow at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, will Green's coming back for that one because he's got a day available, so that'll be really cool. And the usual panel's going to be there as well. And then at 4 o'clock, we've got the photo show with Alex and Chris and other Chris is coming back, Chris Dick as well. Uh, he's coming back to join us, which is really, really cool. Um, so we'll see you tomorrow for those two shows. And until then... Have a good weekend, and we'll see you next week. Bye.